Uh, we'll get started at this time. Week one of ecclesiology. We've got the winter semester. The cafeteria lady is back. So we can get things cranked up. Um, to start our class off, uh, I'm going to do a, a brief survey. So I need some feedback from you guys. Um, what What is the first thing that comes to your mind when, if you were to hear this statement? Come to church this Sunday. What is, when you hear somebody invited you to church or you're inviting someone to church, what, what is it, what's going to resonate in their mind? First thing, jump to your head. Come to a, a circus. building. Come to a circus? Come to a circus. A building. Come to my mind. <laughs> go, 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 go to a building at a certain time for an organized presentation. All right, so there's an organized religious function that is occurring in a building Somewhere in your I'm just if it if somebody invited you say hey Mike come out to church this Sunday what are you thinking? Why? Why? <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. What? Well, all right. All right. Well, that's the first thing you do. Hey. I, I, why are you talking to me? Uh, <laughs> what about this one? The the Roman Catholic Church. What comes to your mind? Cathedrals. Cathedrals. Oh, what? Okay, so some religious rituals. Uh, incense. Okay. Incense. Um, I want some of that incense deodorant. I mean, that, I like that smell of that incense. That, that was pretty good. All right. Um, last one. Hey, because uh, kids are outside. Andrew's got the kids outside, and there's lightning. And so he says, kids, go back inside the church. <laughs> Safety, okay, safety, right? Uh, go go in there because that's where it's safe, right? Go into that building, if you will. Um, a lot of things that that we said here in our in our our go-to instinct when we hear the word church, a lot of it is a cultural understanding of what the word church is. Um, this study that we're going through is intended to help us understand what God's word says the church is um and i think what it our responses i think are very are a good indicator of our how we are culturally just um uh, we respond to traditions right a a traditional understanding what church is it's either a building uh, or or this place where we have these religious functions right or maybe the institution uh, but as we go through this, uh, we're going to see that God, what God says the church is, it's a lot different than how we typically respond or what we think when we say church. Um, so the key, the key to this class uh, is uh, the importance of understanding the nature and the purpose of the church. Uh, there is a lot, a lot, a lot of misunderstanding about what a biblical church is and what it's all about. Uh, first, before I go any further, um, I am, and you guys are benefiting uh, from a direction that God led pastor a number of years ago to make sure that we were, that we are a biblical church, a church that lines up with what scripture says um, the church should be, right? Um, not this huge religious institution, not this uh, moralistic activity that we go through uh, regularly on a Sunday morning, uh, but a, but a, a vibrant biblical church. And so, uh, if you have never thanked Pastor, please make sure you do, uh, because God really uh, directed him to make sure we were following those biblical principles. Um, but there is a huge misunderstanding, and we live in the belt buckle. Uh, as a friend of mine calls it, the belt buckle of the Bible belt, right here in Pensacola, right? I mean, we are we are in it. And but if you were to sample so many of these churches, and I can't speak definitively about every single church, right? I'm not saying we're the only ones who who understand what the church is supposed to be, but there are so many that have a complete misunderstanding of what the biblical church is is all about. Um, just some of the well, uh, if you were to, to go into the typical, talk to the, the Christians, you know, I say generally speaking, you're asking what the church is. They're, um, what they, 
their description of the church really, did, you're going to find it doesn't really match up with what we see in Acts and in the New Testament epistles. Um, there's some that may think that they're lining up with parts of Acts that the church should be about, but we've covered some of that in, in previous classes. Um, but we, ha- we, have ev- we have all kinds of misunderstandings. Uh, the, the church is the new Israel, right? The church replaces Israel. It's called replacement theology. That's a that's a, a hot topic or a, um, what's that? What do they call that? A um, whatever. I forget what they call it. Uh, but it's uh, it, I mean, it, it's a popular it's, it's a popular uh, theology now. The church does not. We're going to see this in the Old Testament. We don't replace Israel. God's not done with Israel. He pushed the pause button on Israel, but he still has unfulfilled promises that that he is going to um, keep to the nation of Israel in future years. Um, a lot of people think the church is a social club. It's all about the programs, all about all the activities that you're doing in society, right? All the moralistic, all the good activities uh, that folks are doing. Uh, a lot of people see church as where we worship God. Well, let me ask you, but, but I have, I'm going to put a disclaimer on this because do we worship God when we gather together on a Sunday or tonight, right? Yes, we do. But in our contemporary culture, worshiping God is all about, it's where I go to feel good about God. And so you have this whole litany of uh, music and dance and drama. And maybe if there's time at the end of all that, there's a little sermonette about how I can have my best life now. Right? And somebody may throw in the term God every once in a while. Um. We, uh, we have, you know, the church is a hotbed of morality. It's where I go to learn about what not to do so I don't, so God isn't annoyed with me, right? I need to learn all things I've got to cut out of my life to keep God happy with me. Uh, there's so many misunderstandings what, what church is about. We have mega churches. We have relevant churches. We have one name churches. We have legalistic churches, seeker friendly churches. I mean, it's it's all kinds of churches that are out there proliferating all, all over the United States and, uh, and Christianity. But what we want to do is make sure what does the Bible say about the church? So some of the things that we will cover in this course um, Ultimately, at the end of this, at the end of the 11 weeks, uh, hopefully you come away from this with a better understanding, uh, an ability to define, biblically define what church is. Uh, And that's where we're going to kind of start off with this evening. Uh, Number two, observe its uniqueness in God's plans. And I think that's why uh, the Old Testament survey and what we're, you know, what we're covering in ecclesiology, they dovetail so nicely together because we're all going to see those distinctions. Um, I find it interesting that Peter said, now Peter, a Jew himself, right, uh, said towards the end of his life and wrote in his epistles that it's speaking to the church, he says, we have the best promises. Uh, pastor summed up the Old Testament as of just, you know, uh, with this odor of failure all about it, right? It's like, the <laughs> reminds me of this guy I used to work with, uh, his name was Billy Reed. And uh, Billy Reed grew up as a cowboy and um, worked on this huge ranch and, and he was driving trucks at Coca-Cola when I was. And I don't think Billy Reed ever saw a stick of deodorant in his entire life. <laughs> and he was the kind of guy who would walk into a room, he would leave, and then you would walk into that room and you knew he had been there, right? Um, that's kind of the failure that we smell on the Old Testament, Right. But Peter says that the church, that we have better promises, right? We see that in Hebrews over and over. Peter says we have the best promises. These are promises. This this is a distinctness about the church than it's so different from the Old Testament and what God was doing with his people at that time. And so hopefully we'll have a better appreciation for that. Uh, The church versus the local church or local congregations. Uh, We'll look at a a biblical history of the church. Uh, The idea of membership, uh, where we see the idea of membership in in the Bible uh, of the church. Um, How God has established authority to work within the church. Um, 
and you're going to see that the the biblical a biblical church operates a lot differently than how typical and i say throw just churches how they operate uh the authority structure um and number seven practical applications to what we are learning about the church there's got to be a so what factor in this this is not all about head knowledge this should affect the way we operate it should affect the way we relate to one another as a body of believers and so if you come away from here with a bunch of head knowledge but it doesn't affect how you relate to james and mackenzie as fellow believers then then we haven't done a good job or i haven't done a good job or you haven't you weren't paying attention one of the other maybe both happens i don't know but but we're not we're not getting to the you know the the, the importance of, of this right uh, so a better understanding of what, how God has designed the church to work and to operate, its identity, its purpose, should affect the way we relate to one another and whether we are carrying out what God has for us as a church. So um, ecclesiology is a big honking word. Uh, break it down real nice. And it, it's the doctrine or the teachings of the church. Um, it comes from uh, the Greek word ekklesia, which is the word we're going to look at here shortly. That is translated church in our English uh, in our English translations. And uh, ology comes from logos. You see there, uh, it just has the idea of a teaching, a doctrine, uh, science, uh, and so that's where we get the idea of the doctrine of the church. So. Um, it, the word church, the English word church, it actually is a transliteration of the Greek word koriakos. You can kind of hear it. Um, you know, it, it had a number of years to, to kind of build up there. Um, it kind of, you see a little bit further down, uh, the Germans, the German word was kirche. Um, would that be how you pronounce that, Pastor? Kirche. 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 Okay. Uh, Scottish term, it was the Scottish kirk. Uh, but you can kind of hear that, Koriakos, you can kind of hear it in those words. Actually, and this is here the interesting thing, uh, so we have our English word church, it's a transliteration, so basically transliteration is you're hearing this word in another language, and you're kind of making it sound like a word in your language, creating a, a, lang a word that sounds similar to that. It's This word, Koriakos, is only used twice in the New Testament. And it, it means something that belongs to the Lord. You see it in Corinthians referring to uh, the Lordian table, right? Uh, referring to the Lord's Supper. And then we also have it here in uh, Revelation chapter 1, verse 10, the Lordian day or the day of the Lord, the day belonging to the Lord. A couple interesting things about this. Um, Koriakos is, is, once, is only used twice in the New Testament. Uh, and then also, it's never used to refer to actual believers. So this is going to hint at a problem, and I think it's part of the root of the misunderstanding of where we come with our cultural understanding of a church being a building or this religious activity that we do on a certain day of the week. Um, the word church was carried over from the German and Scottish uh, into the, the English word church. And we see here that the usage of the word church in our English translation of the Bible has often been a source of misunderstanding. So uh, those, I think most of you were in pastor's theology class the last, uh, last semester. And uh, I know he, he did um, a segment on bibliology. And we can be, we know for sure uh, as believers that we have faith that we possess God's inspired and preserved word in the copies of the manuscripts of, written in the original languages of Greek, Hebrew, Aramaic, right? We, we have those. We have God's word. What you have here is what we also have translations of God's word into modern language. So we have English, Spanish, you know, Russian, uh, Swahili, right? We have these translations. Um, we can be confident that we have accurate and reliable translations of God's inspired, preserved word in our modern languages. But you have to remember that translation is a difficult business, right? Um, 
it, it can be very difficult to translate one language directly into another. Um, I think of um, a phrase that I learned. I had some Spanish-speaking friends in college, and, and one of the phrases they like to say was, que onda? Pastor, you know what, what that, you ever heard that one? Me- Mexican slang. Uh, it was, it literally means how wavy, right? But they would use it to say, cool. Like, it was the equivalent of groovy, right? How wavy. If you were just say, hey, man, how wavy, people are like, what's going on, right? And so that would be very, that's very difficult for us to translate um, it exactly into English here. Um, even excellent translations like the King James Version, there are times uh, it can have some difficulties, so for a variety of reasons, whether it's languages change, right? I mean, we, we, have to, we have to be honest with ourselves that the English language has changed since the 1600s, right? And so sometimes we have a, we have a hard time with that. Um, but we're also going to see, unfortunately, the word church was kind of forced upon the text in the King James Version, actually in a number of the English versions. And I think it's kind of contributed to some of the, uh, our cultural misunderstandings of what the church is. And, and so let me, let's me let do a little history lesson here. Uh, William Tyndale, born in the late 1400s, uh, was training to be a Catholic priest, uh, excellent scholar, trained in uh, Greek and Hebrew. Uh, in the early 1500s, he comes under the influence of Martin Luther's teachings, and he begins reading the Greek texts. Um, as he's influenced by the the teachings of the Reformation and reading through the Greek text himself, he comes to realize that justification is by faith and faith alone. Salvation wasn't in the Roman Catholic Church. It was by faith uh, in in God's promise to us about what Christ has provided for us. So he he begins to um, be at odds with the Catholic Church that he had been ordained a priest in. And uh, he is quoted as saying, following an argument with a Catholic clergyman about this guy's lack of reverence for God's word, he said that if God spare my life ere many years, I will cause a boy that driveth the plow uh, that he shall know more of the scripture than thou dost. William Tyndale was motivated to get God's word into the hands of, of, of English commoners. Because at that time, God's word was only translated in Latin, which was, that was the only thing accessible to a lot. And what the Roman Catholic Church is, they kept it under wraps. They didn't want the common person reading it. They wanted to be the dispensers of God's truth. That way they can control the narrative, kind of like the media today likes to control the narrative. Well, that's what the religious institution was doing at that time. They're controlling the narrative uh, and bringing people into subjection to the Roman Catholic Church by not providing them a translation of God's word in their modern language. So that was William Tyndale's uh, desire. Um, he later was uh, based, he was later um, persecuted and executed by the Roman Catholic Church for translating uh, the Greek text into English. One of the things that Tyndale did, when he was translating the Greek text into English, was he replaced in the word ecclesia, he translated it congregation instead of church. And the reason he did that was because the word church had the connotation of a building and the religious institution that was made up of a hierarchy. The word congregation better represented the meaning of the Greek word ekklesia. Because it points to, as we're going to see here, it points to a called out assembly. And so, why? let me ask you this. Why would the Roman Catholic Church be um, scared of someone using a more literal translation of the word ekklesia and saying congregation rather than church? What'd you say? Takes away their authority robs them of the power. Um, and so for 
not only for, you know, this isn't the only reason, but the very fact that Tyndale had the audacity to translate God's word into the, the, the common language uh, so that individuals could read it and understand it for themselves was, was the reason why the Roman Catholic Church murdered him. So fast forward about 100 years later, after Tyndale's translation, there had been a number of other English translations. Um, and uh, the, one in, the one that was commonly used about 1600 was the Geneva Bible. Well, King James I comes to power in um, early 1600s. 1603 calls the Hampton uh, Court Conference. And he's got, uh, at that time, the, England had broken away from the Roman Catholic Church and they had a Roman Catholic Church light. They had the Church of England, right? Um, and so there, there were Puritans within the Church of England that, ex, that had these concerns about uh, things that were going on within this the government-run religious institution, the state-controlled Church of England. And so he has this conference. And, uh, and so the, the conservative Church of England group and then the Puritans were kind of coming at him from, from different angles. And one of the things the Puritans wanted was they wanted a new translation. And uh, the Puritans, they, they're, they're, they were more like, our understanding, they had a more congregational view of what the church is all about. But King James wasn't having any of that because he was the Grand Mahoff of the Church of England. And uh, the divine right of kings was something that had been uh, passed down for, for centuries, this idea that, and part of it is biblical, right? We, we do know in Ro from Romans that the powers that be are ordained of God. But instead of being humbled by that, you had these rulers of Europe and, and, and uh, medieval world, uh, they, were, they were puffed up about it. They thought that meant they could do whatever they wanted. And so there were notes in the Geneva Bible uh, that kind of cut away from the idea of the divine right of kings. So King James was kind of, he was in favor of a new translation. And so uh, he, he commissions this new translation and they, um, under the, the, um, the uh, oversight of the Archbishop of Canterbury, uh, Richard Bancroft, uh, this gentleman here, uh, Bancroft, was given the responsibility of overseeing the translation work of 50 different scholars from the Church of England. But King James had 15 principles that they had abide by in their translation. And the third principle, he says... Um, Let's see, uh, I'll just quote uh, the source here. It says, he ordered the translators to follow his 15 principles of translation that would be sure to support the ecclesiastical system, most especially the third principle, which states, the old ecclesiastical words are to be kept, uh, viz. the word church is not to be translated congregation. That was... That was in one of the 15 principles, King James said, you cannot translate Ecclesia's congregation. It has to be church. Well, why? Once again, it supports the hierarchical uh, institution that was in place. So this is not to undermine our King James Bible, but it is the, it, it, this is the importance of why we have the Bible Institute. If you are a student of God's word and you're a believer, right? We have the, you have the capital T teacher. You have the Holy Spirit. And if you were to take your King James Bible or you take an English translation that says church and you were to read those passages in context, right? I believe you would understand that what God's word is talking about is the idea of the congregation, the body of believers. But how many people actually do that? How many people read God's word in context, right? And so because so many people are not serious students of God's word, so many people don't have the confidence of studying it, they'll just, they'll just go with the, our cultural understanding of what the word church is. And so it's important that we, we study out these things. But also, you need to understand what Tyndale understood, that even that plowboy right? If he was a believer in Jesus Christ, he was, he had the Holy Spirit. 
and he could be illuminated to understanding God's truth. And so where there may be situations in, in our translations where something doesn't line completely up, we can know that God will lead us to that truth. And so it, it's not to undermine our faith. It just means we need to be students of the word, studying it out for ourselves. And so there was a fear uh, that the translation of the word ecclesia into congregation or assembly would undermine the institutional authority and power uh, that, that the, the church had over the common people there. Um, and so although we see that uh, we have excellent English translations there in, in the King James, there was actually a political motivation behind the commissioning of this translation uh, that unfortunately uh, for many people obscured the meaning of the word ecclesia. So uh, let's take a look at the Greek word primarily translated church in English versions, and then we're, go we're going to kind of go from there. Uh, so it is the, the word ecclesia. Uh, it is a compound word. Uh, you see the first word being ek, that's a little preposition there, it means out or out from, uh, when you get the idea of a source, right? So I'm out from Philadelphia, and so I was not following the game in the service last evening, uh, but, right, I do cheer for the Eagles, right, because I'm out from Philadelphia. So out my source, right, is the Philadelphia area. Uh, the other word is kaleo, so it has the idea of to call. And it gets, you get this idea from Ecclesia as a called out assembly. The vast majority of the uses of Ecclesia in the New Testament is referring to the body of Christ. The group of individuals all over the world that have put their faith and trust in what Christ did on the cross and his resurrection provides salvation for man. But not every single use of the word ecclesia is referring to the body of Christ. There are certain instances where that word ecclesia is used in a non-technical way, not referring to um, not referring to the body of Christ or, or believers. Uh, we see one example in Acts chapter 7, verse 38. Um, and uh, I believe it's Stephen there. He's talking about the ecclesia of Israel in the wilderness or the assembly of Israel in the wilderness. Uh, it's not, some people want to make this the basis for the church in Israel being the same thing. But if you understand that word ecclesia can be used in a non-technical way, it can simply mean an assembly, a group of Israelites meeting together in the wilderness. Uh, that would clear some of that up. Um, Acts 19.32, you have this angry mob of Ephesians that are rioting and they're ready to hang up uh, Paul by his toenails. Luke uses the word ecclesia to refer to that, that mob of people. These aren't believers. This is just an assembly, a group of individuals who have come together for that purpose of stringing up Paul uh, by his toes. They want to kill him. But primarily, in the vast majority of the uses of ecclesia, it's not referring to a building it's not referring to a religious institution where you have some hierarchy and bureaucracy. It's referring to the body of Christ. All believers from Sri Lanka to Sheboygan, Wisconsin, right? All believers. He's referring here. This are called out assembly. So this begs the question, right? What are, what are believers in Jesus Christ? Those who put their faith in the gospel for salvation what are we being called out of or called out from the world? Where do we see that? We, we want some biblical proof, right? Uh, let's go ahead and turn to Acts 15, verse 14. We're going to see um, we have the Council of Jerusalem occurring in Acts chapter 15. We have the record of some of the statements by uh, Paul and Peter. And James here in verse 13, he stands up and, and speaks to uh, this, this group of believers here in Jerusalem. And he says, and after they had held their peace, James answered, saying, men and brethren, hearken unto me, Simeon, 
uh, hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them or out from them a people for his name. Peter here referring to Cornelius and, and those Gentiles that were saved. They were saved out from the Gentile world to be now to be a part of a people that carried the name of God, the character of God. Right? They were called out from the Gentile nations. Uh, John chapter 17, verse 14. Let's go ahead and turn there. Jesus speaking to God the Father in the upper room. Uh, we have this uh, be better represented as the Lord's Prayer. Um, as he's praying to the Father, he says, I have given them, referring to his disciples and those that believed on him while he during his earthly ministry. And he says, and the world hath hated them because they are not of the world. They are not out from the world, even as I am not out from the world. So Christ is saying, my, my identity, my, my source, it's not from this world system. It's, I, I have a heavenly citizenship, right? I, I, have a, I, have a, I have a heavenly birthplace. He's referring to who he is. And he says in verse 15, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but thou shouldest keep them from the evil. But they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Uh, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Verse 18, as thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And we'll touch on some of these verses a little bit later on. Uh, but we're seeing here that Jesus is saying to the Father that just as my, my identity, my source, where I come from is not out from this world system, now those that have believed on me are not out from this world either. Why? Because as a believer in Jesus Christ, you have been called out from this world. You have been called out from this world for God's plans and his purposes in your life. You have a brand new identity and a brand new purpose now that you did not have until you put your faith in Jesus Christ. So let's look at this, uh, this word, the, the world, right? We, we, I think Christianity has done a really good job. Modern Christianity has a, done a really good job of watering down what the world is. Uh, the, well, I can only speak from personal experience. Uh, I got saved a little bit later on in life, but I would say for the first uh, 10 years of my Christian existence, anytime I heard the world talked about, it meant sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Right? That's the world. Kids, you stay away from those three things. You're not worldly. Right? Or you might dress a little worldly if you dress like a rock and roller or something like that. I mean, that's that's what the world was boiled down to. Uh, but uh, we have a really good definition based off of a biblical word study of this word cosmos uh, from Schofield's reference notes. Uh, look at it defines it. it re, the word cosmos or world refers to the order or arrangement under which Satan has organized the world of unbelieving mankind upon his cosmic principles of force, greed, selfishness, ambition, and pleasure. It is often outwardly religious, interesting, scientific, cultured, and elegant, but seething with national and commercial rivalries and ambitions and is dominated by satanic principles. If you were to do, if, if you're ever interested in doing a word study of cosmos, and you were to just go through all those various passages in which it was included, you would, you would come to this same conclusion. Um, the world is so much more than sex, drugs, and rock and roll. It is uh, culture entertainment, technology, politics, the arts, uh, transportation, it's uh, the food industry. It is everything that you and I rub elbows with on a daily basis. And many times it looks really, really good. Schofield says that it's often religious, cultured, and elegant. 
the typical te- as I said, the typical teaching on, on the world is not nearly comprehensive enough, and it often gives a false sense of security to carnal believers. Psh, I'm not I'm not involved in in you know those three activities, so I must be okay. I'm not worldly. But that individual is working 95 hours a week because he's he wants the CEO position and he's sacrificing his family, leaving them behind, right? Because why? Because he's worldly. He sees worldly attainments. He sees uh, pleasure. He sees uh, prestige. He sees all the things that that raise can buy him. Yeah, but he gives money to church. And, and, he, and he, does, he says nice things to old ladies, right? But... This guy is driven by the world system. So let's look at the nature of the world system. Uh, In John 17, 25, since we're already there, we can look at this verse. Uh, Jesus says, O righteous Father, the world hath not known thee. Uh, That word known is our word um, gnosko, which is experiential knowledge. So there's no personal, the the world doesn't have a personal firsthand knowledge of who God is and what he's about. Um, But I have known thee, and these have known thee that thou hast sent me. And so you see that the world, the world is very religious, right? We've got... We've got all kinds of religions all over the world, and there are very well-meaning, good religious people out there in this world doing all kinds of good things. But if they'd never put their faith and trust in Christ's death and burial and resurrection for forgiveness of sins and acceptance with God, they don't really know who God is. And this whole world system is comprised of individuals that have no personal, first-hand knowledge of their creator. Um, we also see that the um, the world is morally bankrupt. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 20. Uh, Peter is um, giving a warning here. Uh, to some believers and and talking about the importance of not allowing themselves to be overcome by sin. But look what he says in verse 20. He says, for if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge or that once again, the, the experiential knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, they are again tangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. And this word, pollutions of the world, has the idea of the defilements. Um, The outline of biblical usage defines it as the foulness of which contaminates one in his interactions with the ungodly mass of mankind. And so have you ever been in a situation or experienced something where you just feel like, oh, I just feel dirty now? I just saw that. I just heard that. And it's just like, I need to go take a shower. Right. Just wash that off. That's this idea, the pollutions of the world, the defilements of the world. It's morally bankrupt. Uh, Go back to Schofield's um, definition. It is um, seething with national and commercial rivalries. Uh, It's built on the principles of force, greed, selfishness, ambition, and pleasure. Right? That's what it operates off of. Um. 1 John chapter 2, 15, we see it as a satanic outlet for the sin nature. And so the world system, if we turn there, 1 John 2, 15, passage many of you are familiar with. John tells these groups of this group of believers he's writing to, he says, love not the world. Uh, literally saying, stop loving the world. He says, neither the things that are in the world. If any man that love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And so Satan has devised the world system in such a way that he uses it as an outlet for our sin natures in order to control lost mankind and 
and to trip up believers. Um, most, as I mentioned before, most of my illustrations are food related. So I think of Baskin Robbins 31 flavors, right? I mean, I, it, it's, it's like one of those um, love hate relationships, right? Because it's awesome to have all those flavors, but then like it takes you 30 minutes to decide which one that you want because there's so many good ones, right? But the world system is constructed in such a way that it offers, it, it just, it has outlets for everybody's sin nature, right? Um, our sin natures are unique to us. There are certain things that drive and motivate um, that, that my sin nature has an appetite for that you might not have an appetite for. Just like I'm not touching the butter pecan ice cream, right? I'm like, Psh, whatever. I want chocolate. I want chunks. I, I, I look at butter pecan. I'm like, Psh, right? Just get away from me. Get off me. But man, will I dive into a you know two or three scoop cone of of chocolate chunk stuff, right? But you know, James, you might roll up in there and be like, oh yeah, pistachio, right? I'm like, dude, whatever. Right. And so it's got what he wants and it's, it, it's got what I want. It's, it, and it's, ser- it serves as an outlet. Right. So we know the works of the flesh. We know that it not only involves adultery and murder. Right. But the world also envy, idolatry. Right. Uh, religious superstition, uh, wrath and you name it, whatever, whatever itch that you have, it, the world system has something to scratch that itch. And so it's, it's, it's just like this constant outlet uh, for our sin natures uh, to just kind of just indulge on. Uh, in verse 17, we see it's constantly passing away. He says, and the world passeth away. It's in the, it's in the state of, of passing away and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. So we see that the world system is not eternal. Jesus is not coming back to renovate the world system and make it better. When Jesus comes back, what's he going to do? It's gone, right? He's going to do a brand new thing. But also you see that the world system is constantly reinventing itself, isn't it? Right? I just read, two days ago, Pastor, that skinny jeans are no longer in. Thank the Lord. <laughs> right? They're no longer in. It's, it's officially, skinny jeans are officially out. You give it 10 more years, right? Skinny jeans will be back in. Now, my grandfather, Jiggs, he used to wear those pants, the plaid pants and the pants with the different, you know, like boats on them and stuff. And he was always like, just wait. They'll be back in style one day, you know? Sure enough, I'm still waiting. I'm still waiting. But, uh, but the world system is constantly reinventing itself. Why? To give us a new stimulus, to catch our attention, draw us away from eternal things, Right? To the lost man, so they never even think about eternity, and for the believer to distract us from what God's plan and purpose is for our lives now. Um, we also see in 1 John chapter 5, 18, and this kind of goes along with what I was just saying there, uh, what Satan is doing. Um, 5, 8, 5, 18, John says, We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, um, but he that begot, he that is begotten of God keepeth himself and that wicked one, uh, the wicked one, Satan toucheth him not. Uh, it's interesting. He says, and that wicked one, and we know that we are of God and the whole world lieth in wickedness. The word translated wicked one in verse 18 is the same word translated wickedness in verse 19. I think a better understanding of that is, is this idea that, uh, the whole world is lying in the wicked one. And that word lie has the idea of putting a baby down to rest or someone lying down to crash out, right? Thinking of Bob right now. My man was, he was toast. He was like, I, I'm out, right? He was exhausted. He, he, he slept. And so what is Satan doing in this world system? He is putting people to sleep. Just lulling us to sleep. Uh, uh, just these lullabies. So why? We stop thinking about God. We start thinking about, we stop thinking about his plans, his purposes. We stop thinking about eternity. And all we think about is 
I got to get my new iPhone 17 or 18. Oh, man, I got to renew my season tickets for the, you know, for the Eagles. I got to, you know, I got my kids, uh, I got my kids talent show, you know, next week I got to do. I got to, uh, you know, I got I got this appointment. I got I got a hair appointment. I got to go. And we're, we're just so consumed with this. I got to. I'm gonna fix my hair, right? We, we got all these appoint, you know, got all these things that, that that attract us, right, in the world system, and it causes us to forget about what is eternal. And so Satan is is manipulating and using the world system to to kind of just lull us to sleep, right, uh, to things that are eternal. So, in the last few moments, uh, how should the called out ones, the ones who've been called out from the world? relate to the world in which we live? Well, uh, it is not the bunker mentality, right? Jesus said in, the, in this his, uh, prayer to the Father, he said that I have, um, in verse 15, well, he says, I, I pray that you don't take them out of the world. Leave them here. God doesn't want his called out ones running and scurrying and sticking their head in the sand, pretending that the world system doesn't exist until he comes back. He's leaving us here to do his work, to do his bidding, to do his desirous will amongst other believers and then wherever he has us in a given day. And you rub elbows, you're interacting with the world on a daily basis in your workplace, with your neighbors, family members, at, you know, in all kinds of activities. But he has not saved us. He has not called us out from the world to run away from it and pretend that it doesn't exist, but to live in the midst of it and to reflect his light, right? What does he say in, in uh, uh, Paul say in Philippians? That, uh, that we can be made to shine as lights in a cr- crooked and a perverse world, right? Uh, we, are, we are to be... Um, lights in this world pointing to the light, right? We are made to shine. That was, Steve is talking about the passes on Sunday night. That we're made to shine. is, is It's passive. God is making us shine in the midst of this world so it can point to his glory. Um, they called out ones, the letter B, called out ones should not agape or sacrificially love the world or the things in the world. Use the illustration of the guy who's who's got his eyes set on being a CEO, and that means he's going to have to sacrifice some things, and that's little Johnny's first T-ball game. Sorry, Johnny, can't make it. Got a corporate meeting, right? Hey, buddy, but I'll be there for the next one. Oh, the next one comes along. Hey, got to fly to New York City. Johnny, I love you, right? He's sacrificing something, isn't he? He's sacrificing his fatherly relationship uh, with his son. That's, that's the kind of idea. And sometimes we as believers will sacrifice for something in the world that the world is offering, that the world is, ser- is, is offering up as an outlet for our sin nature, right? But John says, stop loving the world. Um, we see in James chapter 1, verse 14, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 32, that we can possess the things of this world and often have to focus on responsibilities related to the world. So here's the here's the double-edged sword, right? John says, don't love the world. The fact of the matter is, you had to buy a car so you could get here tonight, right? Is it okay for you to have a car? You had to fill up the gas tank to get here, so you need to have a credit card or, you know, I think Andrew pays rolls of pennies, right? You just go in and you just give them rolls of pennies and... Yeah, he, he, that's how he pays. But you had to use some kind of form of fine, you know, money, right, to, in order to get that. That's using the world system. 1 Corinthians 7, Paul says, as those that are using the world system, right, that word use has the idea of borrowing, recognizing that everything that we have and we interact with in this world system is not ours to keep and hold on to. He tells believers that we can use the world system, we can borrow from it, but don't abuse it. And the way I love to, and I know many of my illustrations date me, so some are younger crowd, I'm sorry, but, you know, Folgers, coffee, good to the last drop, right? Now, I would, yeah, I mean, it's Maxwell House, excuse me, Maxwell House, good to the last drop. Well, I don't drink either of those because they are 
I, yeah, they're pretty nasty. But anyway, here, I'm losing, losing my focus here. Um, the idea of good to the last drop, right? That word abusing, it has the idea of using something up to the last drop. I got to have, I got to squeeze every ounce of satisfaction out of this thing. There's a difference between using and borrowing something, right? Recognizing that it's, it, it's not eternal, but it's something that God's either allowed us to have and allowed us to enjoy, but to be able to say, all right, I'm okay with giving it back. I don't need this. This is God's car. God, you want you want me to get in a wreck? You want me to have this car anymore? Okay, it's your car, right? But the individual who's abusing the world system is like, no, I gotta have this. I gotta, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's draining it for every last drop. And so we we can we can if we understand what the world system is all about, we understand we've been called out from this world system. It's not where we get our identity. It's not where we get our purpose, right? It's not what we're living for, right? Our citizenship is in the heavens. We've been called out from this world for God's plans and purposes. Why is this important, right? Let's go back to the so what factor. I think most of the problems that exist within local congregations, I can't say most, but but many problems that occur within a local congregation of believers um, one way or another results from a failure to understand really what it means to be a called out one, being part of ecclesia, the church, the body of Christ. Uh, a couple illustrations here. Uh, but if you have the understanding of the church, right, that it's just this religious institution, this this place where religious activity occurs, and, and it's this building, it's obscuring Right, it, it 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 clouds our understanding, our perspective is that this here is not the church, right? The bulletin that we have in the order of service is not church. You and I are the church, right? We we sing it with the kids in junior church sometimes. I am the church. You are the church. We are the church together. All who follow Jesus all around the world, yes, we're the church together, right? When you and I start looking at one another as being this this group of called out believers with a shared identity and purpose, that's what the church is. Then we start having different types of relationships with one another. Because when Elizabeth rolls up five minutes before me in church and she takes my parking spot, (laughs) right? Which has never happened, but no, because we park. Anyway, but if she does that, I'm not like, oh, how could she do that? I park here every Sunday, right? And she just rolls on up here and parks right there, right? No. If I understand that Elizabeth and I are part, that we are part of the body of Christ, we have a shared identity and purpose, it's like, okay, so what? There's a parking, you know, there's a parking spot. But no, it's just, you know, it's just, I, I come here, I'm doing church. You know, God, I came here and I did church. She took my parking spot. How, that's not fair, right? That's such a wrong view of what church is all about. And so it really serves as kind of like th- that mentality kind of serves as an incubator for religiosity rather than a relationship, right? It, it's a fertile ga- ground for um, performance-based Christianity. It's the thing I do to keep God happy. It's the thing I do because I'm a Christian. No, it's not. It's who you are. The church is your identity. The church is your purpose because you are part of the body of Christ. This called out body of believers, God has called you out of the the world for his plans and his purposes to reflect his glory and reflect his light in this world. Um, An improper perspective of one's identity leads to a misuse of the world. So if you don't understand as a believer in Christ that you've been called out of the world, right? There is a very distinct chance you're going to be tempted to try to find your identity and purpose in this world, right? Um, You know, I am a CEO. I'm, you know, whatever. You know, I am my job. I am my hobby. I am this. I am that. No, you're not. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you've been called out for God's plan and purposes. You may 
work as a CEO, right? You may like to go do origami, or you may be a you may be a florist, right? But that's not who you are. That doesn't define who you are. Christ defines who you are now. And so an improper perspective on one's identity leads to a misuse of the world. Uh, improper perspective on our shared identity leads to division and strife within the church. And I kind of use that illustration of uh, this fake fight between Elizabeth and I. Uh, you know, we, we fail to see many times as us sharing the same identity and purpose, right? We're all on the same team. We're all wearing the same jersey, right? So CC and Pastor, right? Even though there's that animosity, right? Buckeyes, dogs, right? At the end of the day... At the end of the day, yeah, you're on the same team, right? You know, and, you know, I've got the, you know, and I, uh, but if we start seeing each other as different and not having this shared identity as being a called out one in Christ, right? We start having these little petty little divisions and differences. And it's like the Corinthian church when, when uh, Paul said, oh, some of you are of Peter, and some are of Paul, and, and, and some some are of Christ, right? And Paulus, they were they were people followers. They're identifying with the teacher that they were following, rather than being, hey, we are sh- we share the same identity in Christ, right? And so it led to these divisions and these fractions within this local assembly of believers. Why? Because they failed to recognize exactly what the church is all about. Uh, And one of the the things we'll see here in Scripture is one of the major themes of New Testament teaching is unity within the body of Christ. The importance that God places on the unity of believers. And a lot of that's going to come down to our understanding of our identity and our purpose uh, as called out ones. So um, a lot of times I have to catch myself when I use the word church. A lot of times I will use it, you know, in in our cultural understanding. Um, But I, I try to just for even just for my sake, you know, so I'm constantly reminding myself, you know, we, we are the church, church is people, you know, are we going to shoot you if you say, oh, I'm going to church and you're talking about a building? No, right? We understand. But is, as long as we understand, right, what the point of the church is, God's plan, his purpose is, identity for it, um, and I think we're in good shape. All right. Um, any questions? Or com- All right. When Elizabeth took your partner's butt, were you upset? What did you do when you went in there and she was in your chair? Oh, well, I'm about ready. If I wasn't scared of Rob, like getting the aisles out of alignment, um, I'd probably kick a chair over. Yeah. My fear of Rob is what keeps, you know, would keep that. Keep us all in Yeah. <laughs> Anybody else? All right. Fantastic. Looking forward to a great semester.